Thank God is what you're all probably saying right now. Hell, even the ones that wanted this marathon in the first place. You know, guys, I really did not expect the Metal Gear marathon to be my longest one, period. But you know what? Let's not waste any more time on that. Let's wrap this shit up. Here we are, the last two. The duology that makes up Metal Gear Solid V, Ground Zeroes, and The Phantom Pain. One last adventure with Big Boss, because I'm guessing either Konami demanded it, or the critical reception of Peace Walker convinced Mr. Kojima that despite ending the story with Guns of the Patriots, there's still work to be done, and Solid Snake is too old now, Nano Machines be damned. The next MGS title is going to be a huge undertaking, and there's no better proof of that than the fact that Metal Gear Solid V was broken up into two titles. Now, for all intents and purposes, The Phantom Pain is the real meat of the fifth numbered entry, but never before have we gotten a Metal Gear a title like this. Ground Zero saw release a full year and a half before Phantom Pain, and as you may know already, it was essentially a glorified then $30 demo. You can get it for like 10 bucks now, but this angered a lot of people back then. People wanted the full MGS5, and they got a prologue that was ultimately a means to show off the new Fox engine the game was created in. These are remarkable looking games, the best looking Metal Gear Solid in the franchise. I'm stunned over the amount of detail there is while running at an impressively consistent 60 frames per second. Metal Gear Solid 4 couldn't do that, really goes to show how technology ironically improves the further we go back in the timeline. Content wise, Ground Zeroes is a very short prologue to the Phantom Pain, taking place exclusively in this U.S. prison camp in Cuba. The story-based mission shouldn't take you more than one to two hours in your first playthrough. You rescue some hostages from the prison, get them in the chopper, and watch shit go down. There's a handful of other things to do in additional side missions, such as killing specific targets or rescuing Hideo Kojima from the clutches of Konami, but Snake's endeavors never extend beyond these parameters, so again, glorified demo. The Deja Vu missions were pretty cool, one being a small recreation of Metal Gear Solid's intro sequence complete with a retro 3D model, and the other where you control Raiden killing body snatches while running like a ninja in the middle of a caffeine binge. These were console exclusives at the time, but now every version of Ground Zeroes has them for you to enjoy. I'm skimming over the most important thing Ground Zeroes implemented, which was a significantly retooled style of stealth mechanics, but I wanted to cover that for the Phantom Pain segment of this review since I think that's where they're the most applicable. You can't really get the most out of it here. The prison camp is sizable, but there isn't much to procure on site, nor is there much else you can do with these guards besides killing them, choking them, or turning the lights off. Now, for the plot summary, I'll be combining both games together. Really no point in treating them like separate entries when they're quite clearly not. Again, the Sonic 3 and Knuckles of Metal Gear. And since these are the most recent titles, the spoiler warnings are at Omega level here, folks. Let's do this. Let's wrap up the Metal Gear Marathon. When we last saw Snake, or Big Boss, he created his outer heaven with the help of Kazuhiro Miller and almost lost the whole damn thing when Paz, the secret agent of Cypher, hijacked Metal Gear Zeke and threatened to launch a nuke at the United States if Snake and his men didn't bend to the will of Cypher. Snake refused and left Paz for dead in the ocean, but it turns out she survived and was recovered by a U.S. prison camp located in Cuba. Our lovable admirer of monsters, Chico, secretly attempted to rescue Paz from the base as he began harboring deep feelings for the double agent before revealing her true colors, but his efforts turned up fruitless and he was captured alongside Paz. Snake and Miller agreed that it's in their best interest to rescue Chico, and while they're at it, Paz, since being an agent of an organization that tried to disrupt Big Boss's goals, must mean she has valuable information on their ambiguous enemy. While all this is going down, the UN suspects that the MSF has possession of nuclear weapons, and they're not wrong, Metal Gear Zeke and all that, but Snake and Miller don't want them to know that and ignore the UN's request for an inspection. That is until Huey gives the green light on the inspection without Snake and Miller's consent, believing that if they can manage to hide Metal Gear Zeke from the UN during the inspection, the organization will leave the MSF alone in future activities. And now the MSF have to practically scramble like ants to get Mother Base all ready to go for the inspection, while Snake has to deal with extracting Chico and Paz from the military prison. However, that doesn't take too long for the war-torn soldier. He locates both Chico and Paz and gets them on the rescue chopper, but to say things now get massively fucked up beyond all recognition would be an understatement. A bomb is found inside of Paz, prompting Snake and his medic to hideously remove it on the spot, and upon arriving back to Mother Base, Snake witnesses in horror as the entire facility is under attack by Strike Team XOF, a Black Ops cleanup team belonging to Cypher that's being led by the mysterious Skullface, this Jackie Earl Haley Freddy Krueger looking motherfucker that secretly wishes to end Cypher and its leader, Zero. Mother Base is utterly destroyed, leaving Snake, Miller, Chico and Paz with nothing but the scraps on their back, but in one last cruel twist, Paz reveals that a second bomb was secretly placed inside her and sacrifices herself to prevent blowing up the chopper, but she ends up exploding too close to the helicopter and causes it to spiral out of control anyway. The resulting crash injures Miller, kills Chico, and leaves Snake in a coma. In a discreet hospital, Snake momentarily awakens with the doctor telling him that he's been out for a whole nine years, prompting him to faint. When he comes to, he also discovers that he has shrapnel embedded into his forehead and that he lost his left hand, prompting him to faint again. And then he wakes up and finds out that he's now voiced by Kiefer 
Kiefer Sutherland, and then he fades again. Now I'm getting on that last part, the fanning part, not the Kiefer Sutherland part. He's actually voicing Snake now, replacing long runner David Hayter. And like many others, I was uncertain of this change. I've known David Hayter as Snake for years, but Sutherland isn't bad in the role, even if it's just Jack Bauer with an eye patch. It's a serviceable job, so I won't lose sleep over it. But speaking of sleep, Snake wakes up to an assassin attempting to end his life, and this doesn't make him faint, but he is saved thanks to the walking mummy known as Ishmael. The XOF strike team have invaded the hospital and begin relentlessly killing the hospital staff and patients in an effort to locate and kill Snake. It's a bit of a struggle. Okay, it's a huge, slow pain in the ass, but Snake and Ishmael work together to escape the hospital, but if a well-trained strike team wasn't enough to deal with, now there's this giant man on fire that's also looking to kill Snake with the help of his child psychic, who's exactly who you think it is, so let's not waste any more time. The man on fire wipes out the strike team with great balls of fire, f fire, whales, fire, Unicorns? I thought I was finished with the Monster Hunter side quest, so what the fuck is going on here? Snake loses contact with Ishmael, but more help arrives and it's Revolver Ocelot. The two temporarily neutralize the man on fire and escape on horseback. So that was one hell of an alarm clock, but Ocelot states that Cypher is still on the hunt for Snake, and now the whole world wants him dead. And if Snake wants any chance of surviving, he'll need to rebuild his outer heaven. Outfitted with a brand new prosthetic arm, Snake and Ocelot travel to Afghanistan to rescue Master Miller, as he was kidnapped some time ago while training soldiers. Miller is rescued in time, but the man has lost an arm and leg during the time Snake was out, and what we have now is a very angry and unpleasant Miller, but he nevertheless wants to help Snake rebuild the mother base to its former glory and enact revenge on Cypher. I really should have mentioned this during the Peace Walker video, but with Miller rocking these thick shades and being voiced by Robert Ack and Downs, everyone else hears and sees Travis touchdown, right? They played us like a damn fiddle! Come on, start talking, bitch! No longer are they the Militaire Sans Frontier, Snake's army is now the Diamond Dogs, one of many David Bowie references in this game, I can assure you. Soon Snake encounters Skullface, who's looking more and more like a melted Lone Ranger every day I see him, but the real kicker are the new toys he plans on using to take revenge on Cypher and the world, a culture of parasites that can infect and kill anyone that speaks the English language, and Metal Gear Sahelanthropus, a new bipedal mech created for war, courtesy of Huey Emmerich, who was captured during the MSF raid and forced to create the machine for Skullface's agenda. Or so we think. Huey's eventually rescued, but Snake and Miller believe Huey was secretly aware of Cypher's plan to attack the MSF base nine years ago, with Huey doing an absolutely miserable job denying the possibility. In fact, Huey's just a real shit in general, and the cause of a lot of problems in this game. He's constantly lying, trying to play the sympathy card numerous times, and claims to regret everything he's contributed towards Snake's downfall, but deep down, he's an egomaniacal, selfish prick that not only killed his wife Dr. Strangelove off screen because of disagreements, but he planned to use his son as an experiment to test out the Metal Gear's combat abilities. He also planned on jumping ship to Cypher because it would be better for him. It's a miracle this guy wasn't gunned down on the spot, not from lack of trying, mind you. Miller wants the guy shot on sight after learning the truth, but Snake decides to ultimately exile the guy instead, leaving him to fend for himself in the vast ocean. The Diamond Dogs continue to expand, and new foes show up to give Snake trouble. This includes Quiet, a deadly sniper with supernatural abilities thanks to the parasites in her body. The parasites are like the precursor to nanomachines. They can make you do strange shit. Snake can recruit her to the team, assuming you don't pull the trigger when you defeat her, and she even begins to fall for the guy if you bring her to enough missions. Then there's Eli, a young child with a strong resentment towards Big Boss for reasons very obvious to Metal Gear fans, but in case it wasn't clear enough, he's a young liquid snake. And that's pretty much that. As the days pass by, the Diamond Dogs locate and rescue this old man known as Code Talker, the one responsible for the creation of the parasites, who heavily regrets his involvement and wishes to help Snake stop Skullface from causing a massive epidemic. And not to make it sound like I'm skimming through shit here, I'm really not, but in time, Big Boss and his Diamond Dogs find Skullface, and the man is ready to have Snake executed, but unbeknownst to everyone, but no one's to us, Eli and his psychic buddy, who no longer wants anything to do with the man on fire now, suddenly hijack Metal Gear Sahelanthropus and mentally activates it, causing it to rampage throughout the base. The ginormous mech is put out of commission thanks to the combined efforts of the Diamond Dogs, and Skullface is mortally wounded in the scuffle, left to die a pathetic death, until Huey suddenly puts him out of his misery in a more pathetic fashion. The Metal Gear is taken back to the Mother Base as a glorified trophy, but surprise, surprise, Eli and his faction of child soldiers manage to take the Helanthropus right from under Snake's nose and escape with the giant mech to do... things. This part of the story is never resolved in-game. More on that later. But really, Phantom Pain is broken up into two chapters. Skullface's death is the end of chapter one, but chapter two doesn't have much of a story arc. Things just happen and aren't necessarily connected to each other. Eli escapes with Sahelanthropus with no resolution. Mother Base gets infected with a parasite outbreak thanks to Huey, causes Snake to gun down some of his own men. Huey is exiled after said epidemic. Quiet is captured by Soviet soldiers and sacrifices herself to save Big Boss when he attempts to save her. And then we suddenly get the biggest twist of the entire game. This isn't Big Boss. He was the medic on the chopper with Snake during Ground Zero who was given extensive surgery to make him look like the boss's double. Everything involving this phantom snake, everything he's been through, including the establishment of Diamond Dogs, was all just so that the real Big Boss could form his new outer heaven elsewhere while staying under Cypher's radar. After that revelation, the game just ends. Like, 
Like, that's it? I mean, what do you say? This feels barren in the bigger picture. Like, portable ops, nothing much is accomplished here to help flesh out the entire saga. Some things are painted in a different light, I suppose I can say that, and you know what? It's all because of that damn twist. Because this guy isn't Big Boss, that means all of those gruesome events that are supposed to hammer in our heads that this former snake becomes the Big Boss of Outer Heaven we know in Metal Gear MSX, it really means it doesn't add anything, because Big Boss wasn't really there to experience that. So in reality, this game does nothing to develop Big Boss. He gets in his motorcycle before the game kicks off and says, Good luck, Ocelot. Tell Miller to kiss my ass. I asked, though, why? Why do that? Just for a shocking swerve? A part of me believes that they were trying to recapture that Sons of Liberty magic, where this Venom Snake was supposed to represent the player. It wasn't him that built all those buildings or destroyed the Metal Gear or raised that tall army. It was really you all along. The thing is, in Sons of Liberty, that wasn't a meta sense. Here, it's quite literal and doesn't feel as graceful. But when you really break it down, Phantom Pain is not so much about what the story adds to the mythos, but rather exploring certain themes. This is easily the darkest game in the franchise, complete with extremely mature subjects like PTSD and child soldiers. There's plenty of gruesome, gory sequences and more blood than Castlevania bloodlines. To me, it's the most blatant Kojima has ever gotten with the overall message of war is hell. Now, I believe it would have been certainly possible to explore those kind of themes and make a good story that would tie into the saga just fine. Instead, that's left entirely inside these audio cassettes, which further elaborate on certain details such as character motivation, and not to mention one of the biggest pieces of this Phantom Pain puzzle, the involvement of Zero. You know, we're told in Guns of the Patriots that Zero and Big Boss parted ways due to their different interpretations of the boss as well, and I always wanted more clarity on that. What caused Zero to be the guy that started as our commanding officer in Snake Eater, the guy who just seemed to be a lover of James Bond films, to be the one who created the Patriots AI. We get something like that here. It's revealed that in combination of Skullface poisoning Zero with the Parasite and Zero's cipher organization growing out of his control, leading to the MSF massacre among countless other casualties, this ultimately convinces Zero to place the future of the world's infrastructure in the hands of artificial intelligence. While Big Boss was recovering from the MSF raid, we are told that Zero, with the reluctant help of Ocelot, is the one who set everything in motion to get revenge on Skullface. He pays a comatose snake a visit while recovering in the hospital, and he admits that he's remorseful with how bad things have gotten between him and Snake because of his lingering respect towards the man, but he's too late to do anything about it now because he's slowly dying thanks to Skullface and probably won't get to see Big Boss wake up to tell him all this. To think how different things could have been if Big Boss woke up to talk with Zero, and considering how Guns of the Patriots ends, that is heartbreaking. I wanted to explore deeper into the straining relationship between Big Boss and Zero. Why is all this shit in an audio tape? The themes are interesting, the premise is intriguing, but I think it missed the mark. The snake and quiet relationship is cute, but I think quiet sacrifice would have had more impact if this was actually Big Boss. Could have been a great contribution to Big Boss's transformation into the man we know him as in the future. Eli is just there to remind us, hey kids, look, it's Liquid Snake. Liquid Snake is here. Then he just takes the Metal Gear and leaves, taking the young Psycho Mantis with him. He's another one I think that was ham-fisted into this plot. The man on fire is more and more forgotten after the prologue and the fact that he's a reanimated Vulgan from Snake Eater means absolutely nothing besides fan service. The question is, was this all a result of the crumbling relationship between Hideo Kojima and Konami? You know, there's no way in hell I can talk about this game without bringing this up. It's very well known that the development of this game was in some way strained because of the ongoing feud between Kojima and Konami that led to Kojima's departure from the company. And if you were to ask me, I think it's the most obvious with the story. It doesn't really end and it feels incomplete. In fact, those who have the collector's edition of Phantom Pain know that there was an entire third chapter of the game that was completely scrapped that would have followed up Big Boss confronting Eli and his child soldiers after hijacking Sahelanthropus in what was supposed to be a giant throwback to the kingdom of the flies. Now, I don't think that would have really remedied the issue I had with Phantom Pain's narrative, but any closure is better than no closure, and honestly, I'd love to see that third chapter come to life, but it only exists as a concept, with little to no chance of it becoming a reality, even as DLC. You can find more info about it with a quick YouTube search. Give it a look if you got the time. It's interesting. Disappointing, but interesting. I wasn't sure what to expect heading into the final chapter of Big Boss. This being the longest game in the whole goddamn series is number one on top of that list. You know, Guns of the Patriots was 75% movie, 25% game. This is 25% movie and 75% game. But they've done, they've done it. They've made a Metal Gear title where you're actually playing it longer than you are watching it. But fucking hell, Phantom Pain is long. Look at how many hours I put into it before finishing the story. I'm only at what this game considers to be 45%. How long would it take to 100% this son of a bitch? That's a serious question, by the way. If you've done it, post that shit in the comments or on my social media pages. I want pics, damn it. Phantom Pain is basically Peace Walker on steroids and in HD. I mean, you know, HD, HD, not, you know. Once again, or should I say for the first time on the console, this game is mission-based. And besides doing the usual Metal Gear thing of sneaking past enemies to the next objective or outright confronting them in the battle to the 
death, a huge emphasis is placed on building your Diamond Dog HQ. The more you do, the more GMP you can earn, and you can reconstruct and reinforce your headquarters substantially faster by recruiting more soldiers. Your army can make all the difference in completing mission objectives. When you're not using them in field exercises, they're making you advance weapons and tools for easier times, pinpointing locations of enemy squads, or earning you money in other parts of the world. More soldiers can be recruited by completing side objectives, or they may be one of the prisoners you find tied up against their will. Most of the time, though, you'll be recruiting soldiers you knock out on the field and balloon their ass back to Mother Base. Again, I love the Fulton system. It costs money now to use, I was a bit surprised, but it's such a paltry amount, don't even know why they bother with that. You should never go broke from recruiting soldiers, it can only help. You can carry a lot of things with balloons now, animals, child soldiers, military weapons, even vehicles in large containers when you upgrade it enough. I don't know, there's just something inherently funny about it, and satisfying. This bear, for instance, it gave me a lot of shit, like, I know I shouldn't be fighting a bear head on, I'm trying to tranquilize it, damn it. But when it finally went down and I strapped its ass down for a wild ride, that felt good. Now away, noble steed! That's the D-Walker, a miniature Metal Gear walker that could put things to sleep or blow them away with a fucking Gatling gun. It's one of the few buddies you can take along with you once you unlock them. It could be an adorable wolf dog that really helps when sniffing out enemies and prisoners, or maybe you like to travel the countryside on an actual steed, the D-Horse. The horse may end up being your best friend because Phantom Pain centers around two areas, Afghanistan and Africa, and they're huge. This is an open-ended Metal Gear Solid where side missions can be taken on a whim and toned to an abundance of collectibles that Snake can snatch for himself like a shoplifter to increase his material count. The vast amount of space you're given opens up a ton of possibilities for Snake when dealing with the opposition. It feels like there's six or seven different means of completing an objective, and that's amazing. It's great for replayability. Though if you just want to gun everyone down, you can do that too. Enemy reinforcements only last for so long. But like, say, Ocarina of Time, this has a cost. You see, when you're actually at the enemy base or whatever it is you're infiltrating, the game is on. It could be an explosive adventure or a thrilling game of hide and seek. But in between these areas of interest is a whole bunch of nothing. And the horse or walker is practically required to end these long stretches of road Otherwise, you're sprinting for what feels like forever to start your next mission or waiting for your pickup chopper to maybe get you there faster. At any point, you can return to Mother Base and see how far your team has come with reconstruction. That's about it, though. It sort of becomes a hassle to travel through once you begin seriously expanding. Visually, it's a good indicator of progression. What starts as a single plant becomes a sight to behold with a command center, a research and development, a sick bay, just a list of few places that you can build. But about the only thing of any value you can do is activate some cutscenes and raise morale of your staff. Gentlemen, let's raise some morale. Oh, oh shit! shit. We've reached the pinnacle of Snake's physical abilities. He can crawl again now, thankfully. He's gotten past that little Peace Walker episode, but that's just the beginning. I mean, you saw what I did to my men, but you can do that to anyone. You can now sprint and run like hell to avoid confrontations. You can use your prosthetic arm to feel out enemy threats. The binoculars are now a permanent add-on to Snake's arsenal, allowing you to mark enemies and always keep tabs on them, even through walls. It's like detective mode in the Batman Arkham games, or in the context of Metal Gear, the augmented vision mode from Revengeance. There's good old CQC, a very reliable aiming system for guns and other tools. At any point, you can request a supply drop to refill your ammo, call in a different buddy for a new situation or develop and use the new equipment your staff can cook up all in real time. Assuming you're not already under a combat alert, if an enemy spots Snake, you trigger the new reflex mode, where time slows down for a few seconds to give Snake time to deal with the guard before any alerts go off. If you don't deal with him on time, you either begin running for your life or deal with the incoming swarm. But this is a wonderful way to keep Snake under the radar if you can't manage to keep your eyes and ears open at all times. And if you think this might make the game too easy, you can always turn it off. The game gives you better rewards if you don't have it on. I wasn't sure if it was possible, but they outranked Guns of the Patriots in gameplay. This is clearly the best hybrid of stealth and action in the series. Everything feels right, and there's so many options to fit your playstyle. You wanna whip out your rocket launchers for tanks? You can do that. You wanna outfit your sniper rifle with a silencer so you can quietly take down guards from a distance without giving away your location? Well, you gotta complete a few side missions to unlock that feature, but once you do it, it's awesome. Venom Snake is best Snake. There's just no questioning it. Now, if only I didn't think the campaign was the worst in the solid lineup, and I mean that, guys. This is a 40 to 60 hour story campaign for the wrong reason. No other Metal Gear game, hell, not even the Acid series, comes close to approaching that length just by completing the story. Having an unfinished narrative is one thing, but what you have to do just to advance it is a whole other beast. Totally, there's over 50 main campaign missions with over 150 side operations, some of which are required to unlock some main missions, so I don't know why some of these are just not main missions, but whatever. This snake is very fun to play with, and the fact that you're actually playing the game more than watching it could be a good thing for people, but to take over 50 hours to finish a story that's not even a complete one is frankly tiring. I know some ounce of that, maybe because I'm finally 
finally at the end of this marathon and I'm burnt out from the tactical espionage action, but sweet Jesus. The campaign is two chapters long, but the second chapter is mostly filled with chapter one missions at a higher difficulty. They don't even bother updating the context of your chronological progression. The game acts as if you're doing the mission for the first time, despite that it's actually your second time at a higher difficulty. And some of them are required to unlock the fresh, actually progressive story missions. And to nitpick for a second here, I also don't like how every mission has its own set of opening and closing credits. The opening credits kind of spoil the surprise of what to expect in the upcoming mission. Oh, looks like I'm running into the man on fire this mission because the game just blatantly told me so. Now I'm suddenly in less suspense. Each mission having closing credits makes me feel like I'm not so much playing one giant adventure, but rather a large series of micro adventures. I know I can accept this sort of thing on a handheld, but on a console, it's jarring. This is a long, long Metal Gear game, and don't get me wrong, it has a lot of great moments. The sneaking missions are some of the best in Metal Gear, and though there aren't a lot of boss fights in Phantom Pain, the one against Sahelanthropus is fucking amazing. It's like Metal Gear Zeke on crack. It's weird how the prequel games have seemingly more advanced Metal Gears. Look at this thing, it's like a Metal Gear Zone of the Enders crossover. Phantom Pain is phenomenal as a game mechanically, and I'm very happy to say that about the last game in the lineup. If you don't mind listening to a lot of audio tapes to fill you in on details, I think anybody can jump on this and have a good time. And since this is a relatively recent game, I can actually talk about the online mode. So sometime after you start, you can go online and participate in FOB missions, where you can either defend your mother base from approaching threats, or raid someone else's to possibly the game more money or recruit unique soldiers. You'll need a PlayStation Plus or Xbox Live Gold account to do this stuff if you're not playing it on Steam, but I don't think you're really missing out on much. There's plenty of other ways to earn money and new staff, though if you don't have the time or patience, there are microtransactions to act as a shortcut, so to speak, but I don't think you should waste your time. Not a fan of how the classic tuxedo is now paid DLC. It's five bucks as part of a costume bundle, but it's been a free staple of Metal Gear since MGS1. It's just a little irritating, that's all. Metal Gear Online is really nothing we haven't already seen in other games like Call of Duty. You got your basic team death matches along with a few other modes, so you can get more mileage out of your Metal Gear Solid 5 if you have other players to shoot guns with, and I recommend getting friends for this. The PlayStation Network community was a little on the bear side, so I had to acquire some assistance from some fans on my social media pages, and guys, thanks again so much for joining me on such short notice and letting me experience Metal Gear Online. Some of you are clearly in a league of your own, but I'm happy to have taken a rocket punch to the face if it meant getting a laugh out of me and thanks again for the group photo opportunity now give me a hug well ladies and gentlemen we've done it the metal gear marathon is finally over you know it's been one hell of a ride never in my life that i think i would ever play nearly every single metal gear title in such a short amount of time and i say short amount of time but this marathon's been going on since november and I, I want to apologize for all those that could give, that they couldn't give two shits about Metal Gear, the ones that voted for Mother and Star Fox. But for those that did vote for Metal Gear, I hope you got what you asked for. But I ain't doing another marathon this long for a long, long time, and I can guarantee you that. Is this truly the end of the series? Most likely. It's a bummer, but Kojima's not part of Konami anymore, and Konami has officially pulled out of the video game market. But what we already have is more than enough to leave a lasting legacy, and I imagine that legacy lasting a very long time. Solidus would be proud. Who knows, we may see some spiritual successor now that Kojima has his own company. Something tells me that he's done with the whole stealth genre, but I'm sure he's proud of what he's accomplished over the many years he spent on Metal Gear. The Metal Gear Saga is perfect for those looking to add a little tactical flavor to their basic running gun. While in earlier games I wouldn't recommend running and gunning at all, just sneak past everything. It's more rewarding, I find. Some of the game's stories are a little complex, a handful being batshit insane, but these Hideo Kojima games are a huge part of video game culture for good reason. Engaging in both gameplay and story, Metal Gear knows how to keep your ass planet on the couch with its intellectual method of storytelling, while simultaneously having a sense of humor that reminds you that, hey, it's not all that bad. If you haven't begun playing this already, I'll say it again. I recommend getting started with a Legacy Collection for the PS3. It's a great way to get started. Here's to you, Snake, and I want to thank you all for watching and joining me through this long-ass Metal Gear Marathon adventure. Well, you know, that means next up is Mother Series, Earthbound Beginnings, Earthbound, Mother 3, and a special bonus review after the end of that. It's not going to be nearly as long, granted, it's kind of a given, given how many games there are, but I know a lot of you are deeply looking forward to that, so here's hoping I'm looking forward to it as well. With all that said, thank you all for watching, have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care.